Hello, and welcome to Hackers Gonna Hack. If you're joining us live, our speaker is in the Slido discussion answering your questions right now. For audio video issues, click the technical support button below. I'd now like to turn it over to Chloe Misagi for the presentation. Thank you for the warm welcoming. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be here today with you. As she just uh, let you know, and Slido, yeah, feel free to ask any questions throughout this talk. I want to let you guys know that this is a talk around gamification infosec. And such, the best way how to do a uh, talk about gamification is making sure that the talk is also interactive and gamified. So I hope you guys are excited and ready for this. I will be keeping tabs in Slido at the same time, so it will be interactive. So make sure to pay attention because you never know, you might actually learn something brand new. So here we go. So today we're gonna to talk about hackers going to hack. And if you don't know who I am, first of all, my name is Chloe Mustagi. I am the VP of strategy over at Point3 Security. And when I'm not doing that, I'm an ethical hacker advocate. And if you're wondering what is an ethical hacker advocate? Well, uh, basically what I do is I look around our community and see how can I make things better or improve things. So that means getting rights for hackers. That means getting rights for hackers. That means pushing the media to really portray us in a good light instead of using us and seeing us as cyber criminals. I do so as well. Um, but also to bring in diversity and inclusion in our field, making sure that all voices are being represented and have an equal voice. Um, when I'm not that, I'm also the president and co-founder of WOSAC, which is Women of Security. Uh, we have chapters all over the world. I'm also the founder of Women Hackers. Uh, we have recently changed our name to We Are Hackers. Um, basically, it's a wonderful private online community for hackers that represent all underrepresented genders in InfoSec and is a place for us to hack at all levels and also communicate and mingle and get to know each other and know of all the different opportunities out there for us. It's a great community to be proud of and empowering. Uh, when I'm not that, I'm also the Hacker Book Club uh, creator. So basically we read a book every month uh, about the hacker community. It usually it's written by someone in the hacker community. Um, and they attend our, our weekly meetings, which is on Tuesday at 5 p.m. Pacific time. And even the, not just the authors attend, but even those that are mentioned in the book. So we just finished one, uh, Cult of the Dead Cow, and actually had CDC members attending each of the meetings, which was fabulous, including the author of the, for their first meeting and our last meeting. I'm also a podcaster for ITSP Magazine's The Uncommon Journey, along with Alyssa Miller and Phil Wiley. All right, let's dive into the talk now. Now, what are we gonna to cover today? Well, what is gamification? For those that do not know, we'll also do a quick walk through history. Now, I want to let you know ahead of time, this is probably the driest part of this entire talk. But if you pay attention closely, you might have a little fun experience. So keep, it, keep an eye on everything and try your best to recall things. Um, we'll be diving next into how does it work. So one of the things I want to do is talk about cognitive science. So how our brain responds to it and why it works so well. And so by doing that, we have to learn a little bit about the temporal lobe. And within the temporal lobe, there's the hippocampus and the amygdala. And these are the areas of gamification where it thrives. Last but not least, why is it needed? Why your team should be involved in gamification? What are the evidence? Um, with the latest research and some key takeaways. All right, you guys, I hope you're ready for this. Let's do this. All right, first thing first, gamification, the past, present, and of course, its role in InfoSec. All right. So what is gamification? It's basically it's a game is a system in which players engage in an artificial conflict defined by rules that result in a quantifiable outcome. It has features, mechanics, dynamics, and aesthetics. So this is gonna be the driest part, remember, but pay attention and because you never know what's coming up next. So here we go. In 425 BC, dice games were created to fight major famine. And 3100 BC, the first board game was created in Egypt. 
SMH Green Stamp marketers sold stamps to retailers who used them to reward customers. And in 1958, the first video game was invented. Charles Cardo founds a consulting firm called The Game of Work and brings a feedback loops found in sports into the workplace. MUD1 is created by Roy Trobshaw at Essex University. It was the first multi-user virtual world game. Thomas Malone publishes What Makes Things Fun to Learn, a study of intrinsically motivating computer games. And in 1981, the first ever 3D video games were released. Now, American Airlines introduced A Advantage, the first frequent flyer program, and a hotel chain called Holiday Inn saw what American Airlines did and thought, why don't we create our first hotel loyalty program? Which they did. They were the first ones to do it. And of course, follows the car rental as well. So National Car Rental launches their first car rental rewards program. And in 30% of American households now at that time owns an NES. And a new generation of gamers is now born. Now, Richard Bartle publishes Who Plays MUAs, which divides video game players into four unique personality types. And in 2002, Serious Gaming Initiative forges a link between the gaming industry and training, health, education, and public policy. In 2003, Nick Pelling coins the term gamification. In 2007, Bunchball created Dunder Mifflin Infinity, a gamified website for the TV show The Office. It receives over 8 million page views in less than six weeks. 2009, Quest and Learn accepts a class of sixth graders into a game-based learning environment. 2010, DevHub adds a point system to its website and increases their user engagement by 70%. Now, in 2010, a first gamification summit happened in San Francisco, of course, called Gamification Co. And now by 2012, 45,000 people have enrolled in Professor Kevin Warbach's online gamification course through Coursera. In 2012, Mozilla Open Badges Initiative is launched. This is an open source badges that can be used to mark accomplishments online. In 2012, Gartner predicts that 70% of the global 2000 organizations will have at least one gamified application by 2014. And last but not least, in 2014, MT Research predicts that gamification will be a $2.8 billion industry by 2016, which is completely true, but it went way beyond that. It is now expected to be $11 billion entry by the end of this actual year. Now, I know that was a lot of data, but if you paid attention closely, you will see the reason why. Yes, that's right. Pop quiz time is bringing back some memories for you, huh? Well, I promise you it's fun. So in Slido, write, type in your answer, and I'll keep an eye on it. So what year did the first video game come out? Which year, you guys? Which year was the first video game that came out? 1958. Next question. Gamification is expected to become a blank billion dollar industry by the end of 2020. So gamification is expected to be a what billion dollar industry by the end of 2020. Looking at your results in Slido, 11 billion. All right. Now, of course, the fact is, InfoSec has always been gamified. I mean, think about it. CTS, hackathons, bug bounty, many of us became hackers to beat games and to do better than our peers who are better than us. I mean, we found cheat codes, we found other methods for doing so, but most importantly, we hunt for bonds. And it's really like a game of how far does this foxhole go? It's the constant, how can I outsmart this and that? And of course, I'm gonna build an InfoSec timeline too. So in October 10th, 1995, Netscape launches the first ever cash reward for finding security bugs in their Netscape Navigator 2.0 beta. And the first DEF CON CTF was 1996. Now, bug bounty programs were created and managed by companies such as Google, Facebook, and Mozilla based around Netscape's success with having their first quote unquote bug bounty program. Ponte owned started in 2007, and then bug bounty platforms were founded in 2012 and 2013. And these ones are, of course, as you know, Bug Crowd, HackerOne, and Synac. And that was the first time ever 
there was now all these major companies didn't have to have their own bug bounty program. Instead, they could go with a bug bounty platform that would connect hackers with companies or organizations and for them to be able to have some sort of bilateral trust agreement amongst both parties. Now, this is a game changing moment for many hackers because it suddenly brought us in a good light and for people to start seeing that there are these things called ethical hackers and not all of us are cyber criminals. And so bug bounty programs really helped with that. But it also pushed forward on the whole notion of gamification, right? The first one to submit a bug um, that's a high priority will get paid out. So it's one of those things gamification still works and bug bounty platforms are definitely really, really important because we're seeing so much of an increase of gamification infosec now um, and it's helping us in so many ways because now you have more gamified training programs to train security teams and have insight on their team's weaknesses and strengths. And yes, it's back. Pop quiz time. What year was the first bug bounty created? What year, you guys? What year was the first bug bounty program created? 1995. All right. Le fin of the pop quiz time, or is it? We shall see. But so let's go into how does it work now? Now, this is my favorite part because I'm obsessed with the brain and everyone who has seen any of my other talks previously, I always bring up the brain because the brains are the reason why we're stimulating and do what we do and how we think and why humans do and say or take any actions. By knowing the brain, how it works, we have a better understanding of life in general and also how people function and how we can connect with each other more and how we are more connected with each other. So let's get to know your brain. So remember those pop quiz questions that stimulated your brain from that very dry timeline? Well, now it's stimulating the green section of the brain, the temporal lobe. And we're gonna dive into that particular area where gamification thrives. Now, what is the temporal lobe? The temporal lobe, for you to understand, it's, it's involved in processing sensory input and to derive meanings for the appropriate retention of visual memory, language comprehension, and emotion association. It is where gamification thrives and where the amygdala and hippocampus are. So for example, if we go back to those pop quiz questions, uh, you would have noticed that it was very short-term information being derived into meanings, and so then you are able to retain it. And that's how you're able to pull numbers out of your hat or be able to represent facts that are recently learned and known of because in the temporal lobe, that's where the short-term memories um, turn into long-term memories. So we're gonna break that down by first diving into a little bit further into the temporal lobe. And so here's the first activity and then we'll dive into further parts of the temporal lobe. So I'm gonna read a couple of descriptions out loud and you're gonna fill in the blank and you can shout it out in your home or you can whisper it to yourself. Or you know what? You can just put it in Slido, which is awesome because Slido is there. All right, what plant having a permanently woody main stem usually growing to a high height and developing branches at some distance from the ground? What is that? So I just read you a description. What is the image that comes to your head? It's a tree. Next one. The nutritious orange yellow root of a plant of the parsley family. What is it, you guys? And keep an eye on Slido still. It's a carrot. All right, next one. An article of furniture consisting of a flat top supported on one or more legs. It's a table. All right. An institution where instruction is given. I feel like that one's the easiest one I've read so far. School. All right, last one now. A moving cage for carrying passengers from one level to another. Elevator. Excellent, all right. So let's dive further into the temporal lobe. So in the previous activity, including the pop quizzes once again, it stimulates your temporal lobe by hearing a verbal description and creating a visual to show what the description matches to. 
It also provides a quick access to memory and emotional ties. Overall, the temporal lobe works with processing sensory memories to derive meaning. Now, within the temporal lobe, one would find the amygdala and hippocampus. Now, the thing to note about is that if you're wondering how do I remember things better and whatnot, emotion ties help. This is one of the reasons why you'll remember a nightmare over a regular dream, because there's a strong emotion um, associated with a memory, so you'll be able to recall it more. So think about times you're extremely happy, like you do recall most of the events that happen um, by second by second, but in more nightmarish terms, you also recall it too. But if there is no really extreme emotion, um, you're not gonna recall so many details. So let's dive first into the hippocampus. So the hippocampus is where short-term memories are transferred to a long-term memories later in the temporal lobe. Our conscious memories are formed by the hippocampus by taking a snapshot of short-term working memory and committing it to a long-term memory stored in the temporal lobes. And yes, we're gonna do a quick activity. All right, you guys, here we go. So I want you to read through this twice, this list, and I want you to also keep an eye on the order that it is in. So I need to read it twice. Okay, I think that's good enough. Now, these are the next steps I want you to do. I want you to draft an email or pull up a notes app or go old fashioned by writing with your hand and try to write down the objects in order. You have one and a half minutes to complete this task. So go ahead, you can get started. I know you already probably started right when you saw that there was a next step page, so go for it. And then once you kind of fared as much as you possibly can, put it in Slido and let's see who got the best so far of the responses. I know it's a hard task. And yes, I'm totally keeping track of the time. All right, you're almost there. Quickly, write down the last ones. And if you can't find it in complete order, that's okay. Just, just make sure to write down the ones that you do recall, even if it's not in the right particular order. All right. And pencils down, pens down, hands up in the air, or take your hands off your keyboard. Let's dive into this. So let's check it twice here. How many of you guys got this right? I know this is really hard, and I understand that. I mean, uh, how many did you guys get right? Did you get all 10? Did anyone get all 10 in the correct order? If you did, wow, congrats. You have like an incredible short-term memory and hippocampus when it comes to learning. Um, but just remember that uh, to be able to have long-term memory, you first need to work on functioning your hippocampus as well. So doing act exercises like these is very helpful. And so if you're wondering how can I do better next time, you can make a visual story out of it. And that's what experts do. The more crazy the story is, the better. Or make it an emotional story for it to stick. Overall, you want to improve your hippocampus, and you can do that through crossword puzzles, taking a different way home, or whatever destination to do some gaming modules. And if you're wondering, Chloe, wait, I'm, I'm a little confused. How do I do that? Well, just think of it like this. I was walking the streets of London, and I was carrying an umbrella, and it was a little bit rainy. And I looked down at my shoe because I stepped on something that felt a little bit weird, and it was a cuddly toy. Um, but I didn't know really what it was. Like, it could have been like a teddy bear, but its head was cut off. 
it, but it looked like more like a melon stuff animal, believe it or not. Anyway, I just kept walking and I almost slipped um, and fell right into a tree because I think down on the ground there's like some pink looking yogurt. I want to say strawberry yogurt. But I'm really glad that at that time that I quickly noticed the tree and I didn't slip because right at that moment, if I didn't go through that moment, I would have not seen that parrot that just flew by in London. I mean, it must have gone away from someone's home or some zoo, I guess. But I was just so thankful I didn't fall down because I had my laptop on me and I'm wearing this red jumper. And the last time I wore this red jumper was when I played basketball with my father. So you see there was emotion elements, crazy elements, so I can recall the list in order. So let's now talk about your amygdala. And the amygdala is my favorite part of the brain. So the amygdala is the almond-shaped section of nervous tissue located in the temporal side lobe of your brain, which is responsible for your emotions, your survival instincts, and memories. These items are based around social construction. And if you're wondering what is a social constructive belief, um, so social construction is things around your environment that told you to be careful of things, um, or to put things in categories, things that are like us, things that are not like us. So for example, if you watched on the news or you watched in cartoons or your parents, um, their reaction towards seeing like spiders and snakes, you're always gonna be afraid of spiders and snakes in the back of your mind because you know that it's a real threat. So if you see a spider or a snake, you're either gonna do two things. You're either gonna try to kill it or you're gonna run far, far away. So this is a survival mechanism, the fight versus flight. And it's really important to understand that this is completely subconscious. And the only time that you're able to be aware of that is when it becomes something, uh, a message going to your prefrontal cortex of your brain. But this helps with your emotion. So having emotion connected to a memory, but also when there's a, a ticking down clock, it stimulates an emotion of stress. And when you start getting anxious and stress, uh, you'll either do two things, which is you will just stay frozen or you will work a lot faster in the most meditative way. All right, so let's dive into my favorite part now. Why gamification helps security teams. Let's be honest now, okay? Certs are not enough and new tools and new exploits come out all the time and being aware of everything at all times and the trends along with the burnout and the lack of team members, it leaves us in a huge security risk. And how many of you guys have experienced a shortage on your team? And having to take on other hats to help everyone move along? Exactly. So let's dive in why it's needed more than ever and how it's becoming a priority for the InfoSec community. And I also wanna say that this is one of the reasons why I push for gamification more than anything, is I see it as a solution to help with most problems such as burnout, um, having a skill shortage and making sure that you invest in your team. If you want to invest in your team, have a good balance and provide resources that's going to help your team. And so gamification is definitely one of those things as we've seen with our brain. But let's dive into the statistics, of course, because I know we're very data-driven people. So in 2020, gamification combined with other latest technology and trends will have a significant impact on the design of employee performance, globalization of higher education, innovation. And I'm so glad that Gartner said this because it took the words right out of my mouth. So let's dive into the, more of the facts, shall we? So overall, fact number one, within organizations that hold gamification exercises, such as Hackathon, Capture the Flag, Red Team, Blue Team, or Bug Bounty programs are the most common. And almost all, 96% of those that use gamification in the workplace report seeing benefits. And 77% of senior managers agreed that their organization would be safer if they used more gamification. And let's be real, we are in a 3 million personnel shortage. And to address the shortage of skilled cybersecurity workers, reports have suggested that gamers, those that engage and immerse in online competitions, may be the logical next step to plug in the gap. Nearly all 92% of respondents believe that gaming affords players experience and skills critical to cybersecurity threat hunting, such as logic, perseverance and understanding of how to approach adversaries and with a fresh outlook compared to traditional cybersecurity hires. 
Not just that, but 77% of employees find game-based training to be more effective than traditional training methods. Let's be real. Do you guys remember anything that you read in a textbook? No. We learn more when we do hands-on activities at the end of the day. And that's what gamification provides us. It's a way for us to also be able to conquer the biases that exist in InfoSec. The other reason why we have a a personnel shortage is because we're not hiring everyone. We're hiring those that have certain certs or a certain number of years of experience. And we're also, there is definitely discrimination practices happening on our HR side, where based on someone's name or background, we're already judging that they're not gonna be able to be highly technical or not have enough leadership experience. And this also happens when it comes to promoting people. So one of the things that gamification can do is that it can provide recognition by showing what people are capable of doing. So no longer are you looking at resumes based on number of years of experience or certs that you have. You put them right into a simulation and see how they do. And if they rock it, then you know that they should be in the in more into the interview process to join your security team. And this is another way to see who you want to promote too, because usually the ones that are quiet in the back are the ones that you probably should look more into and you don't. So invest in your people, in other words. We do have a skills gap, like I said before, certs are not enough. I mean, how many of you guys have certs? Now, how many of you believe that those certs made you amazing at your job? Think about it. With the skills gaps, we're prone to burnout, uh, breaches, 94% of employees would stay at a company longer if it invested in its career development. And compliance checklist is not enough. It's just the bare minimum. And last but not least, the military is all in. Gamified learning environments are powerful tools for engaged and motivated learning experiences. They're a central component of your cybersecurity training strategy, which is a natural imperative, such as environments help produce qualified personnel to meet the demand signal. In other words, strong correlations between gaming and cybersecurity activities and gaming and retention and gaming and recruitment. And it's very clear that gamification is a real necessity to have. It helps those pain points. And of course, do you guys remember what percentage of companies adopt gamification in the workplace report seeing benefits? 96%. Overall, I want the main takeaway to be here is that gamification transforms security teams and lives. By investing in your people, you're investing in their personal growth. It also helps them continuing the balance of their personal life and work balance life. And if you're a good manager, you want to see your employees be able to rock it way further than you. That's a good manager. Now, overall, from history to brain functioning in data, it is clear that gamification is needed more than ever. So we can all be superheroes every day. And if you're wondering what is why superheroes are today, because if you're either fixing something or you're preventing something or you're finding vulnerabilities, the thing is overall, we're in this together because our curiosity also protects people. Even if you're in sales, even if you're in marketing or operations, the fact that you work for an InfoSec company, thank you. We need more and more people here because we need to exist to make sure that everyone is protected while online. And last but not least, the main takeaways, if you're a hacker, do some CTFs, do some bug bounties, hackathons. You're gonna increase your skills and it's gonna make you more desirable as an applicant. Or if you wanna get that promotion, do those things too. If you're a manager, director of VP or C-level, invest in your team and reduce the skills gap through Gamify Train Platform because the more you reduce that skills gap and the more that you invest in diversity and inclusion, you're going to see less of a burnout. You're going to see a way better security team at the end, so it will reduce your possibilities of breaches because without a good security team, you're more vulnerable to risks such as breaches, and if you have a major breach, we all know this you will lose your product and you can lose your company. Overall, people just never stop learning. Your temporal lobe, request it. 
And thank you guys so much for catching my talk and thank you for existing. I'm in Slido to answer your questions and feel free to DM me at any time on Twitter. My DMs are always open. Thank you RSA Conference for having me.